welcome to another episode of Alan Stead Reviews. Do hit that subscribe button. I know you get used to hearing that people say that every time and you can zone it out. I understand it's like it's a bit annoying sometimes, but it does help the channel grow. And I can see that quite a few people have watched my video and there's quite a few hours of view time, but not as many people have subscribed. So I'm just giving you a little nudge there, sort of, a, you know. Anyway, if I had to choose my favourite artist of all time, it would be David Bowie. Uh, I have so many favourite artists. I mean, how do you compare John Williams to David Bowie? Well, you can't. They're both great in their own field. So he's not best at everything. But generally speaking, David Bowie is my favourite artist. And so that's why this video has taken a long time to do. And it became a bit of a labour of love for me. And I just thought, well, it's just going to take longer. And that's it. I'm going to do some shorter form videos as well. So I'm going to try and keep the sort of speed up a bit. But suffice to say, I got there in the end. Now, back in the 1980s, as a teenager, my brother got into David Bowie for the first time. And as a child, I was conscious of uh, this attic room where my brother, the music he was doing, David Bowie, Star Wars and stuff like that. It was all this alluring world that was just sort of beyond my grasp of my imagination. I couldn't quite work it all out. Anyway, so I knew through that, I knew lots of Bowie tracks, the, the more well-known ones for years. They were sort of part of my psyche. And by the time I got to the late 90s, I decided I was going to get the albums myself on CD. I bought the 1990-1991 remasters that have all the bonus tracks on. They were really good for having those bonus tracks. Uh, but the 1999 remasters onwards, the packaging was much better and for various reasons. And they don't have the bonus tracks. And the remastering, for the most part, is a slight improvement from what I've noticed so far, although I have one song that I've, uh, I'll come to later that I think has suffered. The reason I mention this is because his CDs are the ones I'm going to be, for the most part, displaying while I'm talking about the album. And he's very kindly allowed me the use of them and his vinyl because he has a complete vinyl collection of David Bowie's original studio albums in addition to some other stuff as well, which I'll cover in a separate video. So that is very cool. Now I realised putting this video together that I wasn't going to have time to say everything I wanted to about every David Bowie album. So I am going to do individual album reviews at some point in the future. I've got no set timeline on that. But before that, I will do a video about non-album tracks because there are so many and you're missing out on loads of stuff if you only listen to the albums. Songs like Karma Man, Holy Holy, Velvet Goldmine, under pressure that he did with Queen, uh, Absolute Beginners, the list goes on. You've also got albums such as Early On, uh, which is actually quite rare to get now. There's a whole load of things to say about that. The Deram Anthology is worth a mention. That was the album that I had his first album as part of for years. Um, now you can largely get everything that was on there on here, apart from the original version of Space Oddity. Bowie at the Beeb and the Bowie at the Beeb bonus disc, which is really cool. That's a live show which I saw that was in 2000. The live version of I'm Afraid of Americans is easily surpasses the album version. Things like that. You've got, you know, there's the VHS version of uh, Ziggy Stardust there. Uh, we've got it on DVD as well. And there's the vinyl version of it there. And you've got a few other records that he's got as well, like this, which is a really cool best of from 1980. So there's so much stuff to go through and just not enough time to do it in this video. But anyway, let's get to the album rankings. In at number 29, we have to start somewhere, Tin Machine 2. Uh, there's the back cover there. Uh, now in the US, uh, by the record labels or whoever was in charge, they consider that to be uh, too shocking uh, with all the nakedness. So a correction was made to the uh, US release there. Uh, which um, arguably looks a bit weirder, I would say. Uh, there's the original CD that I've got as well, um, unaltered. Now, just in case um, YouTube decides that that's uh, too much to show, um, I'm just going to put this clip in just in case I have to edit it out. Honestly, I can't believe that they didn't let me show you that uh, vinyl album cover there. Honestly, it's one thing for Michelangelo's David and another thing for Tin Machine. Um, just, uh, it's outrageous. I'll explain more about what Tim Machine is uh, when I come to their first album, but this is basically like a watered down version of what they did on that first album. A couple of good tracks, uh, Baby Universal is a good 
bit of gusto that starts the album off with an end bit that sort of reminds me a bit of Holy Holy, a classic Bowie song, and a nice acoustic track, Amlapura. A sort of handful of sort of good other tracks, but most of it is actually pretty bad. Um, Stateside and Sorry, the two songs written by the other guy, are the weakest for me. Um, yeah, so sadly, uh, that comes in pretty low, a 4.5. Number 28, The Buddha of Suburbia. You have to excuse the shininess, it's still in its wrap, as a few of these will be. Um, it was the soundtrack to a TV series of the same name, and that was the original cover, uh, as released in 1993. Sorry to my mate who uh, likes this one, but honestly, I, it doesn't do anything for me. I like the title track. Untitled number one has kind of got a bit of a nice electronic ambient vibe going on. There's hints of that electronic experimentation that he would go on to do, but to be honest, there's a lot of it's just, well, most of it is just very forgettable and uh, a bit of a non-event. It's a bit of a non-album almost for me. So uh, sadly, um, I'm giving that a 4.5. Number 27, Never Let Me Down. This is the weakest of uh, David Bowie's 1980s efforts, uh, although I do really love Zeros, uh, not to be confused with Heroes, um, which is a really cool song, which is the only song which really feels it has that kind of old style Bowie chord sequence that just sort of sort of catches your interest. Um, there's a handful of other tracks on here I like. Um, Beat of Your Drum makes me want to drive along in a 1980s Corvette with the wind blowing through my hair. Maybe just me, but anyway. Um, and uh, my brother quite likes this album because he went uh, to see the Glass Spider Tour uh, in 87, 88, whenever it was he went to see that. So, uh, yeah, it's sadly not one for me. Uh, but I do like moments on it. Uh, it's sort of very big, overproduced 80s uh, stuff. Um, but yeah, 5 out of 10. Number 26, Black Tie, White Noise. Uh, now, it's worth bearing in mind that if you have the original 90s vinyl, um, it misses out uh, two tracks from it, uh, the two instrumentals, The Wedding and Looking for Lester. Um, so worth bearing that in mind. Coming after the two Tim Machine albums, this is actually David Bowie's first official uh, solo album of the 1990s. And it's kind of alternative pop uh, meets electronica meets soul, uh, almost bits of hip hop influences coming in. There's lots of flourishes of trumpet and saxophones throughout this. Um, it's okay. Um, there are uh, some moments I, I, I do really quite like. I like the opening and closing wedding and wedding song. But to be honest with you, um, there's there's nothing that really sort of excites me on this. Um, if I had to choose a favourite, I would probably go for the uh, Morrissey cover uh, towards the end. Um, I know it's going to happen someday, uh, which he transforms into something that's almost a bit reminiscent of the Young Americans era. And uh, yeah, so there you go. 5.5. Um, 5. Number 25, Tin Machine, with its rather uninspiring album cover there. Um, and worth bearing in mind, uh, this 1989 uh, vinyl, uh, a bit like with the uh, Black Tie White Noise, has two tracks missing off it, Run and Sacrifice Yourself. Uh, this is because it couldn't fit onto the vinyl as was released then. I don't know about later copies. After David Bowie felt his music had become too commercial in the 1980s, uh, playing to big stadiums, uh, he decides with uh, forming this band Tin Machine uh, to go completely the opposite direction, go for a sort of a hard rock thing and uh, basically uh, play small venues, all of which got hopelessly overbooked, I think, at the time. Uh, anyway, suffice to say, the end result is it's just kind of middle of the road hard rock um, and not a lot of Bowie magic happening here. I quite like the first half of this album. Uh, Crack City, uh, which pays a subtle homage, well, less than subtle homage probably, uh, uh, to uh, Black Sabbath's uh, Iron Man um, you know, at the start. And uh, Bus Stop, I think, is a really cool song, a really short and sweet song there. Um, but a lot of it I don't like. It's almost like it's trying too hard to shock, but it just comes across as being... Yeah, middle of the road, hard rock. And if I want to listen to hard rock, there's so much better stuff out there that you could go for. Um, 5.5. Number 24, and I have to say a bit of nostalgia kicked in here, Labyrinth. 
Don't look at me like that. Oh, yes, I've included this album in the list. Yes. I know it's 50% David Bowie, 50% Trevor Jones. And the Trevor Jones stuff is sort of very dated and sort of cheesy sounding. But you know what? If you've seen the movie, it just gives you super nostalgia. And you've got to love a bit of dance magic dance. And uh, the Bowie tracks in here I do quite like. As the World Falls Down is really cool. So, yeah, it's just embrace the cheese and enjoy. Um, six... Number 23, Reality. There's my little two-disc edition there. I'll uh, tell you more about that. you have to watch the uh, album review on that one, won't you? Uh, yeah, it's a bit boring, um, quite frankly. Uh, I do like the stuff on here, but it's just a bit monotonous. Uh, Days does break things up a bit. Lovely little acoustic uh, song there with some nice keyboard bits. Um, and Reality, the title track, has a little bit of gusto to it. Uh, Never Get Old, I quite like as well. But to be honest with you, it's just a lot of it just kind of is a bit flat and just doesn't go anywhere. Even the, the closing track, uh, br um, Bring Me the Disco King um, is just doesn't do anything for me. Uh, six. Number 22, Hours. Now, this does have quite an elaborate gatefold sleeve, but it's a bit awkward to open up, so I have to save that for my other video. My criticisms of this are pretty similar to that of reality, really. I quite like it, like I like reality, but it's just, it's a bit sort of boring and it feels like uh, a sort of a bit of a. I, I remember being disappointed by this after Earthling favorite track if i'm dreaming my life um least favorite it would be a toss-up between something in the air and uh what's uh, really happening uh, which uh doesn't do anything for me um yeah oh regard look the uh the sort of 3d thing there which was a cool thing and how my version of the cd is different uh, yeah, that's interesting stuff for you there a six number 21 tonight Most people, it seems, just write this off as being the disappointing follow-up to Let's Dance. And yeah, a lot of this album is fairly average. The final two tracks are terrible, but they're the only uh, two songs on the album that I think are genuinely bad. Loving the Alien, which kicks off the album, is a superb track and one of uh, David Bowie's finest uh, songs from the 1980s a touch of epicness to it and sort of religious uh, sort of subject matter and stuff um, and also blue jean is a great uh, pop song i'll tell you more about that on the individual album review um yeah uh, so honestly uh, i'm actually being quite kind there um but justified a 6.5 number 20 earthling uh, with its lovely unopened cover there. Uh, it's a gatefold sleeve. Uh, so that's something for you to look forward to in the other video. This is actually the first David Bowie album I owned. And uh, I was really into stuff like Prodigy and Chemical Brothers at the time. So this really appealed to me. This is his experiment uh, with going fully into the sort of dance genre. Uh, although he blends it with rock stars and does it in a very unique, quirky Bowie way. Um, it's not perfect. There's lots of stuff that kind of loses me along the way. And I think it almost could have pushed it a bit more experimental. That being said, um, Little Wonder is a great track. Uh, definitely check that out, the album version. Um, and my favourite track on here is Dead Man Walking, uh, which has a great uh, chorus uh, guitar uh, part. And um, oh, Mike Garson is present throughout this album as well. Great uh, pianist. Uh, so that um, just adds an extra element and a flavour, uh, which is really good. Uh, 7.5. We're stepping up a bit here. In at number 19, Young Americans. This album's a really good example of Bowie just completely switching genres. And he, yeah, I'm, I've, I'm conflicted on this one, I'll be honest. Uh, Fame, Young Americans, both classic songs. Uh, no complaints there. Uh, I also like Can You Hear Me and Right, um, in many respects, uh, is my uh, favourite song off the album. Though the remaster has done something strange to it. I listened to this version from 1991 that I've got. I will go into that deeper on my individual album review. But anyway, 
the rest of the album, I have to say, I, I don't dislike it, but I, it doesn't really do a lot for me. And I think his vocals kind of, he gets a little bit over the top, trying to be a little bit too croony. And uh, while the backing vocalists work great, he just his voice gets a bit annoying sometimes. And Across the Universe, uh, which is a cover of a John Lennon song, and John Lennon even features on that, uh, uh, as well as the song Fame, um, is just a terrible cover version of uh, a really nice... Um, a Beatles song, um, a John Lennon song. So, um, yeah, I am conflicted. 7.5. Number 18, Lodger. I will just open up the uh, gatefold there because that makes uh, a lot more sense. Uh, they achieved that image by squashing a pane of glass down on top of him. Um, the things you do for art, I guess. This album is just a random hodgepodge of different ideas and experiments at the tail end of the uh, Berlin era. This is the third album of that trilogy. And yeah, I think that's both its strength and its weakness. Um, it's like a box of chocolates and one of them is DJ, uh, which I don't like. Um, that being said, uh, Fantastic Voyage, which kicks off the album, uh, is a really great track and kind of reminds me a bit of the stuff he did on Station to Station, but like a bite-sized version of that. And Repetition has got this um, sort of hypnotic sort of uh, feel to it. Um, it's a song about someone beating his wife, sort of kind of dark subject matter there. But I just love his sort of spoken vocals and these sort of weird wibbly sound effects in that. Um, so, yeah, I like that. Uh, it's, it's just, yeah, it's all over the place and it kind of works-ish. 7.5. Number 17, Pinups. And I just realised the other day that uh, is Twiggy, or Twig the Wonder Kid, um, as David Bowie calls her in Driving Saturday, which is really cool. Seems really obvious now when I look at it. Um, yeah, uh, and there's the back cover. This is David Bowie's cover versions album of songs that were originally released between 1964 and 1967. And I'm going to say something controversial here because um, with the exception of See Emily Play, which I think is probably equally as good on here as the original, and I can't explain, which actually doesn't work so well for me, I think all the songs on here are improvements on the originals. Uh, yep, yep, I know. Um, Sorrow, particularly, that's probably my favourite track on the album, is, is a great, great song. It was the single. Shapes of Things, I like the ones with strings in, they're sort of a bit interesting. Um, but it's just a good, solid rock and roll album. It's good fun. I, like I said, I, I have listened to the originals. I'm not um, a big fan of, of them, so I'm perhaps not the best person to judge that. And uh, I know that most people will disagree with me on that. But yeah, there you go. 7.5. Number 16 outside that's the 2021 uh, release of the vinyl uh, non-gatefold uh, the 2015 gatefold is there um, neither of which have been opened so that's a treat for you there um, the original version released in the 90s was an edited down version of the album uh, so that's kind of a recurring theme in the uh, uh, sort of late 80s early 90s sort of omitting tracks from the vinyl releases um, but yeah, yeah. This is definitely Bowie's weirdest and most experimental album. Uh, Brian Eno and Mike Garson are both back on board, as they would be again on the album Earthling. Uh, but this time, it's much more experimental and avant-garde. And it, not every song. There's some more normal songs on here. But A Small Plot of Land is a very experimental number, for instance, that they spent over a year working on. Hello, Space Boy is a song you might be familiar with, more likely you'll be familiar with the Pet Shop Boys remix, uh, which I don't actually like. Uh, it sort of softens down um, the whole sound of it. I much prefer the driving album version, which is a lot more aggressive. Um, there's the other single, The Heart's Filthy Lesson. I particularly love the piano break in that. It's uh, in the album version. It's lost in the single version. That I it's It was used in the film Seven, uh, and it really... This album actually has a similar vibe in the tone of, of what's going on here. That The concept is about a series of murders um, and an investigator following uh, what's happening there. There are a series of segues with narrations. Some of it does get a bit silly and overindulgent. Other parts of this album don't perhaps push the experimentation as far as I'd like to see it go. So it really is a mixed bag. Um, my favourite track, I would have to say, is uh, We Prick You. Um, Please show respect, even if you disagree. Um, I, yeah, really cool stuff. 
the closing track, Strangers When We Meet, is a track that's only just recently grown on me. Uh, I never thought so much of it, and it is a sort of kind of a kind of relatively conventional way to finish off the record. Um, but it's a re recording of a song that he did on The Buddha of Suburbia, um, and a much better version than the one that's on there. But yeah, it's, it's a really uh, mixed bag. Uh, imperfect as it is, I'm. I, I really appreciate that he did this record and it was a definite mark to point where he'd sort of said goodbye to that over commercialization to say the least that he'd gone into before. Eight out of 10. Number 15. Let's dance. This is easily the most successful David Bowie album of all time, commercially speaking. It's a great pop record. Noel Rogers puts his uh, production stamp all over it. And you've got that great run of the three singles which kicks off the album. Um, my personal favourite being China Girl, but Let's Dance. I mean, what a great song, a floor filler that you can sing along to. I also really like on the flip side of the record, um, Criminal World is probably my personal favourite from that side. <laughs> I prefer the original version of Cat People Putting Out the Fire, which was um, a standalone single. It was included on a film soundtrack, um, but that's just a personal thing. There's not a bad track on this album. Now, some albums, uh, like take bits of Outside, for instance, um, bits of the electronic beats and stuff maybe sound a little bit dated. But with this, uh, you could say, it was, some people might say it's dated, but it's, I would say, confidently of its time. And there's always a difference between those two things. This is confidently of its time and almost representative of its time, of what was going on in 1983. Um, so yeah, an 8.5. It's not um, anywhere near being my favourite David Bowie album, but it is a really solid record. Number 14, Heathen. I still remember walking into Woolworths back in 2002 and looking up on the shelves and seeing this album had been released. I didn't know there was a new one due. And so I bought it, took it home, and having been disappointed by hours a few years prior, I, my expectations were low. And suddenly I was transported back to 1970s David Bowie. All the unexpectedness, the, the string arrangements, the eccentricity of the songwriting, um, the, just the style of the chord sequences that are happening. Slip Away would be a personal favourite of mine there. Um, just, I just love the vocals on that, sounding very young vo um, vocally. Um, his vocals don't sound young all throughout it. The, 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 the quality of his vocals varies from track to track. Uh, Frayed would perhaps be my least favourite because I'm not a fan of the lyrics or the vocals on that. Um, but you've also got three covers on here. My favourite being um, I Took a Trip on a Gemini Spaceship. Uh, seriously, listen to the original version of that. It shows how good Bowie is at doing cover versions. It's such a different version. The original is really odd. Um, you've got the album is bookended by the songs Sunday and Heathen the Rays, uh, which are very different in vibe to the rest of the record. Uh, and kind of uh, with the style of synths and that, make a bit of a nod back to the uh, low heroes period, uh, although with a different twist, uh, sort of more song songy. Um, yeah, A Better Future is a great song. Just song after song, that is, it's just a really good album. And, uh, you know, thank God for Heathen that it, it came came along. It really restored my faith in his music making. Um, terrific album. 8.5. Uh, it's not perfect, but it is terrific. In at number 13, we have the eponymously titled debut album release from 1967. Um, now, this completely flopped at the time, and it wasn't until Space Oddity was released a couple of years later as a single uh, that David Bowie got a bit of commercial attention, and The World of David Bowie was released. Um, this was a much more well-known uh, release back at the, in the day, uh, which contained mostly uh, tracks from that first album, but um, uh, three of them were swapped out for other songs uh, that were from that period and then later um, during uh, the Ziggy Stardust period there was uh, this album uh, called Images which has got some pretty cool artwork on that um, which was a double album which again chose I think 12 of the tracks from the album although a couple of them might be different versions um, and uh, in addition to that yeah other tracks as well uh, so um, it's only been recently uh, re-released as a proper um album release uh, in, in recent years so that that's really cool yes I put this album this high up the list uh, people just seem to write this album off and chuck it way down at the bottom and uh, yeah 
it's a great album. It's musical theatre. It, yes, it's a bit sort of silly at points. Um, it's from the Laughing Gnome era, and, and that's why people just go, oh, well, you didn't really do the proper stuff until Space Oddity onwards. No, uh, this has got some great um, songs. When I Live My Dream, Silly Boy of Blue, a lush orchestral arrangements on that, some darker subject matter on um, We Are Hungry Men, Little Bombardier, uh, the closing track, uh, Please Mr. Gravedigger. But what I like is every song on here is a little story being told about someone else that's living in this area, I imagine in my mind, sort of a, a sort of slightly old-fashioned area in the, in the 1960s or whenever it's set. Um, and it's sort of just, just really nice and lush storytelling. And forget about being cool, because this, this is the new cool. Nine. You won't like it. Captain's Log Additional, a uh, couple of important points here. If you're going to stream this album, make sure it has all of its tracks. Uh, it came up as a 12-track album on Spotify. Um, there's meant to be 14 songs. I don't know if they've solved that now, but anyway, it's worth just always double-checking these things. Also, uh, do go for the stereo version. There is a mono version available now as well, but the stereo version is good. I mean, you can always, you get both if you get the CD. And do go for the Dulux edition, which is this version I've got here, because there's an entire second disc which has uh, loads of stuff that he did mostly just after this album, and it sort of kind of ventures into more of a sort of psychedelic pop territory. Um, it's got uh, some of the stuff he did uh, during Love You Till Tuesday as well, uh, which is a great film. I will go more into this uh, on my individual album review. Number 12. Aladdin Sane. Now, this may be number 12 on my list, but that is probably my favourite uh, Bowie album cover. Uh, there's the back there, and I'm actually just going to show you the inside uh, there because that is super cool. Uh, there you go. Recorded during brief gaps in the Ziggy Stardust tour, this is effectively the first David Bowie album he did when he was a famous person and um there's definitely a bit of an american influence beginning to creep in here he was he was touring america at this point and perhaps hints of where he was going to go in the future but generally speaking this is just a solid glam rock album and uh, the only reason I don't bump it higher up this list is because it's not as experimental or wild or interesting as some of the other albums uh gene genie is probably my favorite track of here uh it's a big improvement on the single version which is still a good song but it's uh, just more solid on this record the three songs that are led musically speaking by mike garson on the keyboards uh sort of break things up really nicely aladdin saying time and the closing lady grinning soul which is particularly beautiful uh but aladdin saying is a, is a close tie uh, with uh, the gene genie for my favorite track on here the only song I don't like is the opening Watch That Man because the vocals are too low in the mix, just like that sounds wrong, and I'm just the song's a bit average for me. But that's my only gripe with this record. Uh, 9.5 out of 10. Number 11, The Man Who Sold the World. Uh, yep, that's not the album cover you were expecting, was it? Uh, that was the original US album cover as released in November 1970. Uh, it wasn't released in the UK until uh, April 1971, and that is the more commonly accepted album cover now. There's the back. Um, but at the time, that wasn't very well known either, and it wasn't until the Ziggy Stardust re-release... Um, in 1972 uh, that the album got a lot more attention so if you were around in the 70s that is probably the version that you had of that this album is the first to feature well almost the spiders from mars lineup um mick ronson's playing is prevalent throughout and it has a rocky heavy edge that uh, the stuff he'd done before this doesn't have and it's kind of a bit like an unbridled version of ziggy stardust in some respects um it hasn't been tamed yet and they make a few experiments some of which work better than others but but that's what i love about it um the opening track the width of a circle they spent a lot more time on than the rest of the album i believe they spent a week on that and maybe a week on the rest of the album and it's an eight minute song it goes through different sections and it, it really works um, also all the mad men, men that comes afterwards um, is a song that he wrote about his schizophrenic half brother and it was a very dark time in his life uh, that's a brilliant song um, everything on the first side is great the second half the production does let it down it feels a little bit rushed um, with a couple of songs the supermen and uh savior machine um being the vocals being so high in the mix they're pretty much above the mix um which is a shame but it doesn't 
it doesn't put me off the songs. I think I think I still think they sound great, and the title track sounds fine. I have no issues with that. So it is. Uh, it's a very interesting album to listen to, and not in the least bit commercial. And uh, yeah, it's a nine point five. Um, it's more interesting than Aladdin saying. That's why I put it higher. Number ten, Scary Monsters and Super Creeps. Uh, now I think that's one that would have lent itself nicely to having. Uh, a gatefold sleeve uh, as you can see how it looks with the cd there because it kind of continues across um but uh, they didn't do that that was what they did on the inside but they could have done something like that but alas we have what we have this is Bowie being a bit influenced by the new wave stuff that was coming out at the time and uh well yeah the first half of this album is just perfect um Robert Pripp appears throughout this album a fantastic guitar player um I don't even know what scales he's playing in um when it comes to like scary monsters and super creeps I mean what a fantastic song and um and the guitar solo he does in fashion is like nonsensical and yet it's completely perfect for the song and it, otherwise that would have been a kind of fairly normal pop song in some respects with a little bit of eccentricity but he puts his stamp all over it and turns it into this weirdness uh the opening track this psychotic it's no game number one um is just a great start to the album ashes to ashes uh probably my favorite song of the record either that or the title track the second half though i think this album, a bit like The Man Who Sold the World, suffers from weaker second half syndrome. It's not that the second half is bad. The only song I don't like um, off the second half is Kingdom Come, which I just think is a really weak cover. Um, and it, Bowie's vocals are all over the place. But I like the fact that actually it winds down at the end of the album with It's No Game number two, um, which uh, is like an understated version of the uh, first iteration. Uh, and I do like the bookendy way that um, the sound effect of the tape the reel-to-reel -reel tape coming on at the beginning and then coming off at the end of the album. I do like things like that. Um, Teenage Wildlife, very uh, anthemic song on there. But yeah, like I say, the second half of the album is actually really good, but you just you, you don't always notice it so much just because the first half is so good. Um, 9.5. Uh, yeah. Number nine, The Next Day. Uh, I'm still not even sure if I like this album cover uh, because it's just sort of taking an old album cover, slapping a white square over it and crossing out the title of the other one. It's a, a kind of a rebellion against the concept of doing an album cover, I guess. And so I admire it for that, I guess. Uh, there you go, the inside there. After a 10-year hiatus, David Bowie was back. And it took a while for this album to grow on me. Uh, that's not to say there weren't songs that immediately stood out. Valentine's Day, for instance, which is about the Valentine's Day massacre, is a very short and snappy song that kind of sounds like a hybrid of all the young dudes meets Moon Age Daydream. And it really sort of has that a very young sounding Bowie vocal. And that's a good point, actually. Bowie's vocals on this album sound better and almost yeah younger than he, they did on Hours, Heathen and... Uh, reality um, I don't know whether it's because he gave up smoking or, or whether he's just fresh from having just left things alone for a while and come back that song is immediately followed by the song if you can see me which is a bit of a nod back to the earthling outside period a really high octane full of energy and just sort of transports you to a completely different place a kind of haunting end as well I love that uh, I'd rather be high follows that off a classic uh, just very catchy song Lots of very catchy songs on here. Dare I say, almost a bit of a Bowie's take on a kind of indie sound, um, though that really doesn't do justice to the sort of styles he, he goes through here. He makes many nods back to sort of various things he's done over the years. Um, I particularly love the way the album ends. You've got a run of three songs, uh, You Set the World on Fire, uh, which is more of a sort of rocky number, followed by uh, If You Feel So Lonely You Could Die, uh, which is kind of makes a nod back to the soulfulness of young American though in my opinion it's better than anything off that record um it concludes with heat uh which is a uh, got a that sort of lower vocal uh that sort of older sounding vocal uh where are me now is another one where he do, does that kind of sort of the older sounding vocal basically and uh it nods towards what he would do on black star but very very easy listening album i'm really glad that he did this before doing black star um because it's just it's so fun uh, and yet there's plenty of excitement and twists and turns along the way. 9.5. I will just say this is a little critique. 
on the UK version of this, uh, at the time of its first release, they just add, add three bonus tracks at the end of the album. Um, and I always think that kind of spoils the flow because really it should end with heat. And I think just adding the bonus tracks on is a bit weird. I know it's done a lot of the times and I kind of know why it's done. But yeah, uh, that's why it's kind of called the the two disc edition, which has a whole load of extra bonus tracks and some remixes you don't really need, as well as a DVD as well. But yeah, so I just prefer keeping the bonus tracks as a separate experience to the main album. Number eight, Black Star. As of yet, unopened vinyl there. And so that's another thing to uh, look forward to in the other video I do. Released on his 69th birthday, two days before he sadly died, this is Bowie's final record, and what a hauntingly beautiful record this is. Um, it musically has some of the gothic sort of tonality of, say, outside, but it takes that, moves it into the stratosphere, and makes it a much more significant sort of feeling. Black Star is the opening track of this album, and it, it puts you in a very strange sonic headspace. What a very unusual song it is. And I'm not even going to bother to describe it. It's just that I can't help when I uh, listen to it as to sort of picture that video uh, in, in my mind. Same with Lazarus, um, which musically is simpler. Uh, musically, it sort of reminds me a bit of Slip Away uh, from Heathen. Um, that's not a criticism. It's just uh, there's a musical similarity there. The song that particularly gets me lyrically, I would say, is Dollar Days. Uh, it's just something about the sort of if I never see the English evergreens again, it means nothing to me. Uh, and, you know, I'm dying to. Apparently he looked to Visconti or Visconti looked to him when he said that. And so when I see what you did there, David, that sort of play on words. And, um, you yeah, know, David sort of just smiled back at him. Sort of. So, you know, he knows that he was on the way out when he did this album. Uh, maybe not to begin with during the recording process, so certainly by the end of it. And that is just written all throughout this record. Um, the only track I don't like of it so much is Tis a Pity She Was a Whore doesn't really do so much for me um the other song which uh, uh is a kind of different to the vibe of the rest of the album is sue or in a season of crime uh which uh, originally was kind of an avant-garde sort of jazz epic that he did a couple of years before um which i didn't really like the original of it too much i found it too sprawling and indulgent this focuses it in and makes it surprisingly heavy it's kind of like what he was going for uh perhaps on earthling but it's like he's kind of it's just yeah i mean it doesn't mess around it doesn't pull punches um so right to the end you know he, he's done something that's actually it doesn't shy away from being a little bit aggressive and a little bit sort of out there um i mean it's really out there this album um but mostly beautiful and it finishes off with it you know i can't give everything away um which is a yeah a very lovely way to end the album um 9.5 it's uh, you know only for small reasons is it not a 10 number seven space oddity or as it was originally called at the time, simply David Bowie, because the first album was uh, considered such a flop commercially that this was uh, basically the new starting point for his career. And uh, there's the back cover there. Super cool artwork by George Underwood, who incidentally is the guy who gave David Bowie his dilated pupil uh, by punching him in the eye in a playground fight when they were young. Um, now, the American release had a slightly different cover. Uh, basically, it's called Man of Words, Man of Music, so a slightly variation there. Um, they've gone for a halfway house on the 1999 re-release there uh, with adding the title in as well. Um, now, in 1972, it was re-released as Space Oddity for the first time, and that was the more famous uh, cover that was around in the 70s. So the chances are, if you were in the 70s, uh, that was the one that you had. Um, yeah. First of all, this album begins with Space Oddity, which is just one of my all-time favourite Bowie songs. Uh, if I had to choose one favourite song, it would be that one, probably. Um, the rest of the album, more folk-orientated in its direction. Uh, electric, sort of rock folk on a couple of the songs. And you've also got a very long nine-minute song, uh, The Signet Committee, which is occasionally very beautiful, but I uh, kind of ramshackled and, and rough around the edges. Um, Bowie said of it years later, uh, I don't know what I was going on about in that song, but it all seemed very important at the time. And he really does kind of go into a rant about it. It's quite passionate. Wild-Eyed Boy from Free Cloud is kind of kind of epic with its strings and it uh, sounds like something from a musical happening at the point and uh, orchestrations in that 
ends up with a memory of a free festival which has a nice sort of hey jude style end chorus um but the bit particularly the bits I really love are uh, the uh, occasional dream and letter to Hermione that kind of acoustic uh, soft acoustic wonderfulness which is just uh, really quite beautiful to hear and I, this album owns a, a very special part of my heart and I am giving it a 9.5 it's not perfect there's a few things that he tries out that don't quite 100% work but I quite like that about it um, but can't quite give it full marks because of that in at number six Station to Station. Uh, now, that is an iconic album cover, isn't it? The black and white image in a square inside a white square uh, with the red writing contrasting against the white background uh, is uh, great, isn't it? Why would you want to change anything about that? And yet they did for the CD version um, that was released. I mean, just I don't know where to start with that. I'm just going to show you that. Exhibit A. Um, they have, I think, corrected this for the latest CD releases, I think from 2017 onwards. But just that was the CD release for years um i don't know where to start with that we're gonna to have to put up with that as the uh the thing there but we'll move beyond that um if i had to say what david bowie's coolest album was i would say it's this and i've said uh, use this word about a couple of pink floyd albums um but it's slick um and uh compared to young americans um this album sort of realizes sort of where he was sort of trying to do with the sort of croony style of his vocals um and it, this time it's not overdone apparently he has little to no memory of recording this album he was slow um out of it but his band was a tightly oiled machine at this point, and there's definitely a hint of uh, the sort of Berlin sound coming on, especially on the uh, title track, which starts it off with a, a guitar sounding like a train. Um, you, you kind of have to hear that to uh, understand what I mean, but uh, I didn't realise it was a guitar for years. You've got classic tracks like Golden Years, my personal favourite, Word on a Wing. Um, very fun to play on guitar, that, quite difficult, but very satisfying uh that's a, just a beautiful song so uh, soulful um wild is, i mean there's only six tracks um the record company didn't like this and uh yeah but that that adds it feels almost it's got that quality of like um a prog rock album that's because it's got that, that little amount of tracks and all of them are quite long and they go off into quite jammy sections as well um so yeah i give this a 10 out of 10 um because there's nothing that I can criticise about it, to be honest. Um, oh, Stay, the guitar solo at the end of that. Um, TVC15, I just name every track off the album. There you go. Um, yeah. Number five, Diamond Dogs. Uh, classic album cover there. I will show you the gatefold of this because it makes a lot more sense. There you go. And uh, again, uh, much like with Tin Machine 2, uh, it was considered too shocking to show the uh, dog's genitals, so uh, they airbrushed them out in the original version, but they have been restored. And again, I'm going to do a little segment uh, here, just in case. I cannot believe that YouTube made me take down the full spread of the vinyl. Honestly, it's one thing for Michelangelo's David, quite another thing for Diamond Dogs. There you go. Now, when I talked about in my previous video on Pink Floyd, um, Animals, I said it was based on uh, George Orwell's Animal Farm. No, it wasn't based on, it was inspired by. Um, but in the case of Diamond Dogs, it was originally going to be a musical of 1984. But George Orwell's estate, or whatever happened, it was refused. And it became Diamond Dogs, but remnants of the 1984 thing uh, stay on here. And that sort of apocalyptic sense um, to the album is really helped by that. It's a kind of weird halfway house between the glam rock phase um, of Ziggy Stardust and all that, um, leading into the thin white duke phase of the soul stuff he would do afterwards. Um, and and yet it's also something completely unique unto itself. Um, it's a very, very experimental album. If you've only heard the songs Diamond Dogs and um, Rebel Rebel, um, you, you could be fooled into thinking it was a, it was a more straightforward record. But um, you've got the spooky intro with this sort of howling wolves start it off, uh, or dogs rather. Um, and then you've got the sweet thing uh, and sweet thing reprise with Candidate in the middle. And that song really shows the uh, breadth of David Bowie's voice and um, starting off really low, going to mid range before kind of going to the sort of ziggy heights. So it's almost like showing his voice in a sort of metamorphosis 
Um, and uh, I love the guitar at the end of Sweet Thing Reprise, where it just goes into something that sort of sounds like a grungy, um, punky sort of mess at the end before segueing into... Um, Rebel Rebel, which is uh, a song which a lot of you would be familiar with. But um, actually, of all the songs in the album, actually, I think um, it's one of my least favourite because I, I, I become aware of the fact that guitar solo repeats a lot. Um, apart from maybe 20 30 seconds of the song where it briefly lets off for a moment and once you become aware of that it begins to sort of you begin to notice that repetition doesn't take away from the song I say I still think it's a great song um 1984 is my personal favorite um it's just a, that is a real sort of nod towards where he would be going like on young Americans and station to station that funky sort of uh, sense of what's going on but it's it really does sound like a musical it's big and epic and just the whole weird way the album ends we are the dead is a particularly spooky song I just love the way his vocals slip and slide like a slippy slidey thing throughout that song um it's a uh, 10 out of 10 absolute classic from start to finish in at number four heroes there's the back cover there this is the second album in what is referred to as the Berlin Trilogy of albums, where Brian Eno is quite heavily involved. Uh, Robert Fripp is also on this album, and he features quite prominently on the title track Heroes, which is a song that uh, people who won't be necessarily so familiar with this album will still be familiar with. And it's an absolute classic. It's kind of the centrepiece of Side A. Uh, it's followed by the kind of slightly space agey Sons of the Silent Age, uh, which makes a nod back to sort of his earlier stuff, though with a bit of a sort of new twist on things. Um, the other stuff on Side A is kind of frenetic in its nature, um, really good, but kind of uh, pop that's been put through the grinder. Then you flick over to side B, which kicks off with V2 Schneider, uh, which has an appropriately sort of military style beat um, and kind of sets the vibey scene for the three instrumentals that will follow. Now, these are very sort of minimal instrumentals compared to the instrumentals on low. It takes you on a journey and you kind of forget almost you're listening to your normal album. Well, it's not a normal album before it then finishes off on quite a sort of comparatively pop song um, The Secret Life of Arabia which is a really cool song which finishes off the album it does just kind of fade off at the end that's my only critique of the album uh, is that um, it would have been nice if it had maybe faded off into some kind of soundscape at the end it just feels like it kind of just ends but that's like honestly I'm not going to deduct any marks for that um, 10 out of 10 brilliant album in at number 3 Low uh, and the album cover there, the uh, photo, is actually a promotional shot from The Man Who Fell to Earth. So it's the second David Bowie album in a row to contain an image relating to that film, the other being taken from a scene from the movie. Uh, there's the back cover there with uh, the track listing uh, on a uh, sticker, which is kind of, kind of quite cool. So here we are at the first in the Berlin trilogy of albums. And this... Particularly, Heroes 2, but this particularly is like a film. It's a slow release, a slow burn, if you will. Um, you don't quite realise how brilliant this album is until you've reached the end. The first half has, uh, to begin with, quite frenetic style of songwriting. Uh, it eases up after the, the single Sound and Vision, which is kind of sounds like an obvious pop number, uh, if it was in any other context and then it sort of calms down towards the end um, and you've got a new career in a new town which is a lovely little instrumental with a particularly nice vibe which uh, finishes things off but yeah I, I think that no one individual song is is remarkable but collectively they just flow very nicely together sort of yeah off kilter pop songs if you want to even call it that I don't know how to describe them really you flip into side B and the world changes entirely and you've got four terrific instrumentals. I say instrumentals, there are vocals, but they just um, evoke, uh, they are, they're words that were made up, just they evoke a sense of something. Uh, Warzawa, um, Art Decade, Weeping Wall, and Subterraneans. Each of them put you into a different sonic space. Um, it's very relaxing, but also musically challenging and interesting. And Brian Eno obviously playing a big part of, uh, of that um of that soundscapes that were created um yeah it's it's 10 it is i can imagine people at the time just being really thrown by this and hopefully just really intrigued why i know a lot of people were um it's a brilliant record
I just wanted to add, actually, because I think this is a good way to, to illustrate the difference between Heroes and Low for me. I think Heroes has the stronger songs, and I think Low has the stronger instrumentals. Um, also, if you do think that this album's overrated, I would suggest it's not overrated, it's just understated. Number two, Hunky Dory, with cover art there, again, by... George Underwood, uh, the back cover there with all the writing, I think looks really, really nice. Now, the original CD I've got of it uh, doesn't have the title written on it, and I seem to remember there being a vinyl release uh, that was also the same. Now, this album comes in between The Man Who Sold the World and Ziggy Stardust, and unlike those albums, which are more guitar uh, rock orientated, this is more piano led and acoustic guitar led. Uh, Rick Wakeman plays a lot of the keyboards on this, uh, giving it a more complex feel, and uh, also notably Mick Ronson uh, does the string arrangements. Um, he also would do that on the next album, Ziggy Stardust, although he gets a co credit with uh, David Bowie for that side of things. Uh, but my favourite tracks on here are Changes. Um, Life on Mars, which is one of my all-time favourite Bowie songs, as is Quicksand. Uh, both of them just beautiful string arrangements and piano playing. And uh, then you've got the Bule Brothers, which finishes off the album. A very haunting song uh, written, again, about uh, Bowie's schizophrenic half-brother. He's written, all, as far as I know, three songs. Uh, that one, All the Mad Men and Jump, they say, off uh, Black Tie, White Noise. But this is the greatest of them. But there's so many different moments on top of those songs uh, on this album. Those are my personal favourites. The only song that's a little bit quirky and almost doesn't quite work, but strangely sort of captures the sort of eccentricity of this album, is Eight Line Poem. But I, even then, I, I do like it. It's um, no criticism there. It's just if I had to pick a least favourite, it would be that. Absolute genius, uh, start to finish. Um Andy Warhol, you know, deliberately sort of a rough sounding acoustic recording, Fill Your Heart, uh, sort of makes a sort of nod back to the sort of early days and um, it's a Tiny Tim cover. So anyway, I, I, I could go on 10 out of 10. Classic. Number one, The Rise and Fall of Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars. Uh, now that really is a cover that's kind of lost uh, in its impact slightly on the CD. Uh, so uh, just reflect upon that for a moment. Uh, there is the back cover there, um, and with the careful advice uh, to be played at maximum volume, or as I say, at a reasonable volume, uh, that's good for your neighbours. It's almost ridiculous to think that when Hunky Dory was released at the end of 71, that it wasn't an instantaneous success. And it wasn't until the release of Ziggy Stardust that it sort of became a, a big success. Uh, indeed, the release of Starman, which launched Ziggy Stardust. And uh, this album really takes uh, the sort of rockier edge of The Man Who Sold the World and combines it with the even stronger songwriting of Hunky Dory takes both those elements, throws them into the mix together, streamlines them, sets it in a world where, you know, there's only five years left until the world is, is destroyed um, by some unknown impending apocalypse. And that's the opening song that sort of starts off very understated with that sort of almost heartbeat like beat um, before going into a frenzy where it's just screaming five years. Um, now it ends with a beat as well. And, and then the, a beat comes in for the next song, Soul Love. Um, there's a sort of hint of a funkiness with there, uh, which sort of hint that sort of goes towards the future, in, in, but it has a rockier chorus. And uh, then you've got Moon Age Daydream, which is just classic space rock. At, it was probably the ultimate space rock song. Um, Starman is my favourite song on the record. However, I have a slight gripe with it. Do listen to the UK single version. And in fact, when I listen to it, I just um, swap that one out in the playlist because in the UK, um, the UK single version uh, was put on all the vinyl releases of this album. Um, so if you were in the UK, that was what you heard. That was it. And I was really disappointed when I heard the CD for the first time. Um, anyway, but that's all. I'll do an entire separate video about um, how I feel about that. Um, Lady Stardust is a tribute to um, uh, Mark Bolin, lovely piano ballad, and then starts the story of the rise of Ziggy Stardust, uh, sort of uh, in the second half of the album, uh, going through a lot more upbeat in its feel, uh, sort of culminating in a sort of a, a one climax with Ziggy Stardust, the, the title track, 
um, before ending with rock and roll suicide where he's he's destroyed by his fans um it's a it's a really fun song to play but really difficult on the guitar because it starts off quite simple and then as the song builds emotionally and uh, in terms of all the orchestration and and uh, the band coming in by the end um it's just so many chord changes and he's just screaming give me your hands by the time he gets to the end and then uh, just that single strings finishing off um bosh and the album is done and it's so obviously a 10 out of 10 and you've been a 10 out of 10 for watching um you're a star do pop a comment into that comment section and if you disagree with um some of my choices let me know why i'd be interested to find out or if you agree whatever and uh but obviously please show respect even if you disagree as david bowie himself says or the character he's playing on outside anyway so there you go and uh do hit that subscribe button Come on. Come on. All right.